Hello and welcome. Scott Marler here with the Sunday Recap at Memorial United Methodist Church in Farmington, Missouri, where we love God, grow faith, and serve others. I have a very special and much-anticipated guest this week, Pastor Ron Wheaton. Wheaton? <laughs> <laughs> I do that every now and then. Yeah. I, mess, I mess up. Pastor Ron Beaton with a B, not Wheaton with a W. Last, last week I said reek like seven times trying to film the commercial. It was reek? horrible. Yeah. Last like, like smelling? Well, I was trying to say the word weak, oh, but weak. it came out reek. Reeks. R's and W's often Sometimes. Get, they get conflated. So I don't know if you know this, but we have been eagerly awaiting your arrival. I've been eagerly awaiting my arrival, too. I've been eager to get here. I'm sure you have, and we'll get to that. So today, you started out by saying, Dying, Christ destroyed our death. Rising, Christ restored our life. Christ will come again in glory. And uh, we may have... Those sounded familiar to me. Yeah, so those are the words from the United Methodist uh, Funeral Liturgy. So every time um, someone uh, do a funeral, those are the very first words that they hear when I get behind the pulpit. Um, and so we call it a service of death and resurrection, which I really like because it, it points to um, not just the fact that someone died, but, but the hope that we have in Christ. Um, and so those were the words that I wanted to start my time here together. And I, I said that because not because I want people to think that I think they're dead, um, but rather to acknowledge that Christ is alive and it's uh, the risen Christ that allows us to, to function. So. And then you said, that's why we can point a defiant finger at death. And quote the words from 1 Corinthians 15, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Yeah, those Easter words. It's normally when you hear those words is on Easter Sunday. I loved the visual of pointing my defiant finger at death. I thought of Lane indignantly telling me he's not getting out of the pool, Yeah. right? That was the visual that came to my head, a defiant child pointing my defiant finger at death and saying those words. How does that work out for Lane after? Well, I am the father. <laughs> so he gets out of the pool. <laughs> so eventually yeah. he gets out of the pool. Yeah. So maybe not the greatest. I, I, I wasn't <laughs> making that parallel all the way. Yeah, right, right. You just, you just made some of what came to mind. Yeah, That's yeah, right. Sure. The defiant finger, because he's so convicted. Yeah. And I would feel convicted in this moment, right? Yeah. I just like the image of a defiant finger um, because uh, it's, it's, it's the, 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 the last thing to be defeated, right, is, is death. Um, especially, I feel that um, for so many people, there is, there is no cost too great. There is no, no medical procedure too risky to prevent, um, to try to keep death at bay. But Christians are the ones who point a finger at death and say, you're not going to win. You don't scare me. I, don't, you can, yeah, I can die, but... I'm going to, but Christ is going to win. That's and so, right. Yeah. So that's, I, I'll just love, I love that. I love that passage. Well, that's a great way to open up to our church, I believe. And I wanted to open up the podcast in a similar fashion today and give you that platform on here as well. I know that I kind of butted in and stole some of your thunder, but that's yeah, my that's job. Great. I'm the host. <laughs> okay. So it's quite all right. <laughs> so out there in the sanctuary, that's your playground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here, that's yeah, yeah. when I get to do it. Yeah. yeah. So um, you're finally here. You I have am. finally arrived. So tell me a little bit of your background, where you come from. Give me, give me the um, the Ron Beaton, not Reaton or Wheaton or whatever <laughs> I said first. Uh, synopsis: What you've done before, your education, just your background. Let me know what you've done. Um, I've done a lot of things, but um, so I was born and raised in Kennett, um, down in and the Boot Heel, spitting distance from from Arkansas um, and home of cotton and watermelons and things like that. Um, so I grew up in Kennett and I loved my time there as, and I grew up a Methodist, um, at, at the first United Methodist church. And that's where I was baptized. And, um, that's where I came to faith. And so I'm so grateful for the, the, the formation that I had while I was there. Um, after high school, I went to Murray, um, Murray State University in Western Kentucky. It's where I got my undergraduate undergraduate degree, and that's also where I met Casey, um, who I am now married to. We met at the Murray State Wesley Foundation, the Methodist Campus Ministry, and uh, and and we 
we fell in love and, and we both went to seminary together. We, I felt a call to ministry um, while, <laughs> of all things, at annual conference. Um, good things can come out of annual conference. Um, and, um, and, and kind of just gave, gave my life to ministry at that point. Um, before that, I, was, I would have loved to have been in like in a career of politics or you know, something. That was what I really enjoyed. And, and yet God saved me from, from that <laughs> heathen way of life. Um, and so, um, so Casey and I uh, both went to seminary together. And we went to Duke Divinity School in Durham, North Carolina. So fight Blue Devils fight. Um, yeah, you don't get that on many church podcasts, do you? Fight Blue Devils. Um, and, uh, and we had a wonderful formational experience there. I'm so great, uh, grateful that I got to go to Duke. Um, um, it's a method at one of the 13 Methodist seminaries. Um, and, and Duke was a place where, you know, you, you go to some seminaries and you read, you read books written by smart people. But when you go to Duke, you're actually like, the people who are writing the books or the one who are teaching the class. So it's really just an amazing opportunity to be there and, and study under some of the greatest theologians of our generation. Um, so that was really um, a really great opportunity. Out of seminary, I was appointed to um, Appleton City, Missouri in western Missouri, kind of halfway between Kansas City and Springfield. Um, there were more cows than there are people, but it was a, I loved it. It was like, think Mayberry right. um, town. And uh, two-point charge, Appleton City and Montrose. Um, and then later on, um, my wife was at Rockville at a, at a United Methodist Church there. Um, ended up with that, that kind of shifted a little bit. And then we had Isaac and Hannah, our two kids, um, Isaac six and Hannah's three. And, uh, and at that point, Casey transitioned being, to being a full-time mom. And um, so then from there, we moved to Dexter, uh, Missouri, just you know, about an, two and a half hours away from here, southeast of here. And, um, and we were there for three years and we loved it there. That was great because it was close to Kennett. It was close to my dad who lives in Popper Bluff. Um, and so we really enjoyed our time there. And, um, now we're in Farmington. So there's, there's the Reader's Digest version of Ron. You've brought me up to date. Yeah. That was a lot of information, wasn't it? I I loved it though. So I have a couple of questions. Number one, you mentioned your first appointment was a two point appointment, right? Right. Is that, is that something that is, um, does that happen often within the Methodist Church? Because we've had you now. Um, last week we had I'm drawing a blank. What's her name? Oh, Ann Mowry. Ann Mowry, mm-hmm. and then we had Pastor Hall. And all three of you mentioned early in your careers you had uh, two point charges. So is that something that happens frequently? Yeah, that's uh, that's not uncommon, um, uh, especially in in smaller congregations. Maybe they can't support a full time pastor, and and so they'll team up with another another church or there's just another church uh, another congregation that's close by and it would be difficult just to find enough clergy to fill all of these spaces and um, so um, yeah that's that's not uncommon at all in fact sometimes there's people have three I know a guy who God have mercy on his soul had four at one oh point. my gosh um, so yeah no that's that's not uncommon it's not uncommon at all <laughs> well you're in the big leagues now yeah you got promoted to Farmington well, Missouri <laughs> well instead of two churches I got three services so I'm <laughs> I'm, now I'm really worn out. So, um, welcome to Farmington. Thanks. I'm probably not the first person to say that. You are not. I know that our church is very welcoming, and I'm sure that they've been um, very instrumental in getting you settled in. How's that transition been? Oh, it's been amazing. Um, the church has been unbelievably hospitable. Um, the they've so as as the pastor, you get a parsonage. A house that comes with the job, and um, they have put time and energy and finances into updating and renovating that parsonage. I mean, it's it's like a completely different home than what I saw um, just a month and a half ago. And so the, the amount of work they put in, and so quickly, um, what a what a wonderful way to feel welcome. And then people have been bringing us food and gift mm-hmm. cards and all those things that I like to eat. So now, being good. from Kennett. You had visited Farmington, I'm sure, before. I had, yeah. Um, so I, when we would have district events um, for, like I was on the soccer team or, or speech and debate or whatever the case might be, we would come up here for district events. Um, and I always, thought, I always thought it was really a great town, um, just a beautiful town. It seemed 
there was there was more restaurants, <laughs> uh, which I liked. But it was also it just seemed like a very uh, very clean and, and 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 beautiful town. And so I was I always thought it would be a nice place to live. Also, my um, sister in law, my my brother and my sister in law just recently got married. Um, actually, this past uh, December. And she was from Ironton originally, and then was uh, a lieutenant with the Highway Patrol in Farmington. Oh wow! And so she married my brother and moved moved down south, and then I came up here. So swap places. Yeah, we swap places. So I, you know, I, I knew of it through through Amy and and that's so, it. Yeah. Well, like I said, welcome. We're glad to have you. Thank you. I, well, so far, <laughs> plenty of time to falsify. <laughs> yeah. So let's jump into our scripture for today. Sorry, this is probably making lots of noise on the Yeah, just, you know, you just got to be quiet with it. Just be careful. <laughs> gentle, yeah. yeah, just gentle, gently. You can you can do it and get away with it without yeah. Derek getting mad at us. But <laughs> yeah. he's, he looks angry. <laughs> he looks angry as I... Okay, so we're in 2 Kings. Um, I'm going to be reading from chapter 2. I'm going to do the first two verses of chapter 2, and then to make it hard on us, we skip (laughs) down to verse 6, and I'm going to go 6 through 14. So buckle up. Here we go. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay there, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as... You yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now down on verse 6. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company stood as prophets also went, and stood at the same distance from them, as they both were standing on the Jordan. Then Elijah looked at his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you I am taken before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. Then he responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet... If you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted to you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, the chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended into the whirlwind into heaven. Ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, "Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen!" But he could no longer. But when he could no longer see them, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle that Elijah had, that of Elijah that had fallen to him, and he went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Then when he had struck the water, the water was parted to one side and to the other, and Elijah went over. Wow, so much in that scripture. So, first of all, uh, this you said that this was last week's. Scripture lesson, right? right. Which came fr- from the um, the Revised Common Lectionary. Mm-hmm. So I love the lectionary, and it's it's near and dear to my heart. So when you said that, my heart kind of skipped a little bit of a beat, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is awesome. But I love it that there's people who get excited about the lectionary. That, right. That's pretty cool in and of itself. I, well, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, no, that's good. So Scott, that's nice. We, I, I saw that you said that, but then. Immediately, I started thinking about this story, and I thought, how perfect is this? Right, right. Isn't it funny how those God incidences seem to take place sometimes? Yeah. So this story is all about kind of a transfer of knowledge and of of, of responsibility. And that's a great first sermon for you to give. And I think that you did it very eloquently and beautifully. But the hard part of this is I think that out there, if you're keeping count, how many times I, I mix up Elisha and Elisha? <laughs> right, I know. It's so tough. it's hard to keep straight in your mind. Maybe we should call them Fred and, <laughs> and Grober. Well, I call them, uh, in my notes, EJ. EJ. EJ, EJ and, and ES. And ES, okay. Right? I like it. So here's here's the synopsis. Here's what's going on. There's This is kind of like a school from what I was reading. There's a bunch of prophets that are kind of gathered together. Yeah. And they, they're, they're going from town to town, and 
Elisha, no, Elijah is, is everybody's, all the prophets are coming to him and Elisha saying, hey, he's leaving. Right. And you said that that's, that's so probably fresh on your mind because that's what has happened. Right. 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 People have just been coming to you and said, hey, I heard you're leaving. Yeah. And what was the Kenneth lingo? Oh, um, yeah. So, Eli- Elisha says they they keep saying, you know, you know, Elijah's about to leave. And let me let me see what this says. Um, he says, uh, "I live," and then coming down to six. As the Lord lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company, the prophets, also went and stood some distance as they were standing in the Jordan. Okay, so I actually, it's in the it, it's in the part that's that we didn't read this week. Do you know that the Lord today will take your master away from you? And Elisha said, "Yes, I know. Keep silent." Um, I interpreted that in in boot heel language as, "Yes, I know. Now hush, <laughs> right? Just just hush. I'm so I'm so tired of hearing this. It's it's emotional. It's emotional for me every time you say this. Um, and and so I'm I'm just kind of tired of hearing it. So, but from hush. the flip side of that, on this side of that curtain. You only got to see one side. I heard you're leaving. I heard you're leaving. Right. And all that we have heard as staff of the church, which, um, or, or members of the laity, all that we have been hearing is I heard that there's a new one coming. Yeah. So I like to look at that from that side yeah. too, right? Yeah. Kind of the flip side, because there's so much excitement, but there's a lot of feelings that go along right. with with that question, right? Like you had mentioned, um, have you ever felt like Elijah? And have you ever, what kind of feelings do you think that he had? Did he experience sadness? Was he afraid? Nervousness? I mean, you kind of touched on that and said that you experienced a lot of those mix of emotions, right? Yeah, I did. Um, and partly the reason I named that um, was because I want people to know that um, all of those emotions are valid, that it's okay to feel the way you feel. Um, if 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 you're sad because... Pastor Scott is leaving, or if you're, um, or if you're nervous because there's this transition and you don't know what's going to come, or you're not sure how you feel about somebody who's in their 30s, like young 30s, uh, coming in and being the pastor, like, and you're apprehensive about that, that it's okay to feel those things, and it's also it's also good to feel sad and and joyous at the same time. So I wanted, to, I just wanted to name that I think it's a, that those are valid ways to feel, and you don't need to feel bad about feeling one way and not feeling another. You that you feel the way you feel. And, and I mentioned, um, yeah, the way that I f- felt. So, um, I was sad. I, uh, I was certainly sad that I, and when I was in Dexter, um, I loved that congregation. It was a beautiful congregation and they, they really embraced me and my family and my, my daughter, Hannah moved, we moved to Dexter when she was like three months old. And so you can, that was all she knew, you know, that was, that was her whole life. And so to move your family and, and maybe it's, you know, it's sad. You, you, you're sad to leave that part of your life, but that didn't mean I was any less hopeful or any less joyful about being here. Right. Well, that's the last emotion that you kind of mentioned. You said all of those emotions are fine, but, but more than anything, what you felt was hope. Yeah. That's a powerful emotion. That's the emotion for me that gets me out of bed every day. Yeah. The the hope that I can make a difference in someone's lives or the the hope that we can take this church here in Farmington and spread and do God's will right. or the hope that my new pastor is going to be uh, amazing at softball so he can bring <laughs> our team out of the trenches next year. Wow. wow. <laughs> I said hope. Yeah, hope, hope. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Something's even beyond hope, Scott. No offense. <laughs> So that to me was was a very pivotal point of your sermon. You started off by saying uh, the the United Methodist. What did you call it? The 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 funeral. Oh, the death liturgy, and resurrection. Right? Service of death and resurrection. And so I was kind of on the downslope there, going, "Well, I don't know where we're going with this, but this is where the turning point was for me." Whenever I started to understand the parallels here, and then we start talking about Elijah and Elisha, and so here they are. They're out there. They cross the Jordan, and Elisha says to Elijah, "Hey, I kind of want a double share." And so what that means to break this down a little bit in, in biblical terms, and back then, the, the firstborn got a double share. Right. 
So there's even mention of at the table, they got a double share. So this is referring to the inheritance. And what Elisha is saying here is he's saying, I want a double share of your spirit. I want a double share of what you've got. I want to forever be tied to you. Right, right. I want to have what you have, but he didn't want it. And he didn't express this necessarily in the scripture, but we find out later, he didn't want it for personal gain. He didn't want the power. He wanted to spread the, the word of God in the way that, in prophetically, the way that Elijah had, right? Um, that's certainly how I, how I interpret that, um, is, is that, that Elisha is, um, he, he's eager to do the work of a prophet. Um, he's, and here he is, the student of, of the most notable, one of the most notable prophets there are. Um, and and to take over and to to pick up that mantle, which I'm assuming we're about to talk about. We mantle. are. Yeah. So the mantle, it's uh, it's like a scarf, right? Yeah. I you know I, I honestly I'm not real sure what the mantle looked like, but that's how I've always pictured it, is, is as a mantle. I mean, you, there's several scriptures about mantle about your shoulders. Yes. Um, you know, in, in Song of Solomon and and things. And so um, yeah, that's yeah a a, a, a poncho or a so something. in in my student Bible, I think I've got a. What do I have? An NLT. And it says cloak. A cloak, yeah. A cloak. Mm -hmm. But whatever. Uh, I didn't go with my version of the Bible today, which I do most of the time on this podcast, because the the title of your sermon was Passing of the Mantle. <laughs> <laughs> so it'd be bad if they never had the word mantle. Right. Yeah, I, and and I'm, I was going through, and I was going to cross it out, and I thought, I don't know. I'll come back later in <laughs> years and go, why did I do that? So here's the mantle, and... This is what happens. They cross the Jordan, and this, like you said in your sermon, in Hollywood dramatic fashion, yeah. it can't just have happened, right? Yeah. There has to be the chariot of fire pulled by horses of fire, and it separates the two. I love to put myself in the position, not saying, claiming that I'm a prophet, but just to think about what's going on. You had to be very devout to understand when you got separated by a chariot of fire that it was okay. Yeah. Right? You had to think, because I know me, if a chariot of fire came between us right now, I, I think I'd be running. Yeah. And it would be terrifying. The thing that got me was, is so if you read the rest of the story of Elijah, there's no talk about it. There's no like <laughs> lead up to it. It's just all of a sudden you have a scripture that says, now just before Elijah went up in a whirlwind, and then so somehow all the prophets around know that he's going up in yes. a whirlwind. Like, <laughs> They're prophets. There, that's there, how they know. There's something. He, I guess that's, I guess that's <laughs> it. Like, there's just no, there's no connection there. How did, how did, anyway. So now here he goes. Yeah, so uh, here he goes. In a whirlwind of fire. In a whirlwind of fire. And the, when you did the children's sermon, my son is doing this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you had a little bit of... Uh, and my daughter was talking about unicorns. I, I loved <laughs> yeah, it, though. Yeah, yeah. We, we made a connection. So he's doing that. She's talking about unicorns. And here he is. Here is the prophet Elijah, EJ, going up. And Elisha's on the ground. Now, just before that, the scripture says that Elisha, Elijah had told Elisha, hey, if you see me go then you'll get that double share. Right. So he's watching Elisha here. He's watching this happen. He's watching his, his not master, but for lack of a better yeah. term, the, the person whom he's modeled his life after. And here he goes, and he's crying out, Father, Father, I forget the exact quote, but he's saying, you're taking him. And here he goes, and magically the cloak or mantle falls, yeah. and he picks it up, right? Yeah, yeah, and... Um and that, yeah, that was just, just, it just and that, that was the thing. It, it, in fact, the scripture, I think, and the scripture don't even say that it fell. It's just, he picked it up. It was just like, mysteriously, the one thing that was left behind was <laughs> okay. his mantle. Yeah. And here it is. And now he's got it. And what does he do with it? He rolls it up, right? I think that's what I would have done with it, too. Yeah. I mean, I saw him do this. Yeah. Uh, let's give it a shot. <laughs> let's, see how, let's see if this works. So you made the parallel here between Moses and his staff. And you said, you know, Moses' staff did all of these things, um, s most of which the easiest parallel here is it separated the Red Sea. Now we're at right. the Jordan River, and uh, Elisha wraps it up and smacks the Jordan River with right. it, and, it, and it happens again. Right. So it's, and he crosses with dry ground. This is kind of the passing of the guard or the passing of the mantle right. of this story, right? And to me, it proved Elisha's um, intentions. Yeah. 
right. and it proved that he was devout. And and I wrote this down out of my study bile, Bible, not bile. <laughs> I'm having a lot of trouble today. It said in there that if our motives are pure and we don't have to, then we don't have to be afraid to ask great things from God. When we ask God for great things, powers or ability, we need to be and we need to examine our desires to get rid of any selfishness that we find. Um, to have the Holy Spirit's help, we must be willing to ask. And I think that that when God allowed the Jordan River to be split, it was kind of an affirmation of that in my interpretation. Yeah. I think that that, that was a, an answer to his cries. And he says, where is the God of Elisha? Yeah. Smack the water. It smacks the water. Yeah, yeah. So what an amazing thing. It is. What a, it just And I love that. So so we have you have you, you, of course you have Moses who who separates the water and then you have his successor Joshua mm-hmm. who separates the water. Right. And so now we have Elijah who separates the water and his successor who separates the water. Um, the other the other um, like parallel that I that I see um, and I mentioned this in in my prayer is so Elijah goes up, ascends into heaven um, to make way for his successor. Jesus is the one who ascends into heaven to make way for his successor that comes at Pentecost. Yeah. Right? Um, so I just, I, you know, the way that that all points back, the, the way that Jesus is the new Moses and Jesus is the new Elijah. Right? Um, are, you, just, are you trying to say that there's parallels between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Why, yes, Scott, I am. <laughs> and sometimes the Old Testament points directly to the New Testament? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, um, or the other way around. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, something else that's interesting is that Elijah... Elijah was one of only two people that um, went to heaven without dying. Yes. The other one was Enoch. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah, yeah. bonus points for Scott. Was bad. We're bad we at we're high fiving. Yeah, look at the elbow. Did you know if you look at the elbow, you never miss? I like it. Yeah. Anyway, we're bad at high fives. Yeah, Fun that was facts. probably really loud on the podcast too. So then you started to talk. So now you can see where I could see where this sermon is going. And then you said, listen, you know, I'm kind of picking up the mantle that Scott Hall left, and I'm the successor here. And then you started, you said a quote, I don't know if you said this or not, but I have a guy that I'm, I'm really fond of that helps me out in my extracurricular activities. Um, his, he's a doctor, and he often says, uh, I stand on the shoulders of giants. Oh, yeah. And... He, he often posts things on social media about um, doctors that have come before him right. and, and things of that nature. So you, you said something close to that. I don't yeah. know if you said that I, exactly. If I'm able to keep my head above water, it's only because right. I'm standing on the shoulders of the people who've gone before me. And you listed off just yeah. um, a, a multitude of previous pastors. Not, and you said not just at this location, Scott Hall and his 50 years of ministry. Pastor Hall... Um, gave 50 faithful years to the Lord and you and I are around the same age and to yeah. think that he is just 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 shy of he was in ministry just shy of double my age right that's incredible to me and I think that I've been doing something because I'm on a podcast every week you know <laughs> right, yeah. like to think about that and then to go deeper and you look back and you can trace that lineage of the the yeah. passing of the mantle right. And the people that have come before you, and the people that will come after you, right? right? That that's great responsibility. When a when a pastor is ordained, um, and I think they still do this. When I was ordained, they gave me the kind of a a, a, a laying on of hands succession of of my ordination back to John Wesley. So it was John Wesley ordained Asbury right. and Watcote as as bishops. And then it has all the people who ordained, these other people who became bishops, all the way through, um, for me, it was Bishop Schnazy, Robert Schnazy, right. who then ordained me. And so there's there's the line. And it's amazing. You know, you just look at some of these names, um, and they they weren't perfect. They were um, some of them had their own had their own challenges and but um, people who nonetheless um, were able to pass pass this on to the next generation in some way through through ordination. Um, and I just for me, I think of 
so who was it? Who was, there was somebody who brought Methodism to Farmington. There were the early Methodist circuit riders who used to ride around on their horse and they'd go from town to town with nothing but a saddlebag and a Bible and a horse, right? Um, and, and then I just think of those in the larger church um, who, who helped us to articulate what we believe and why we believe it, like Augustine, to the people who helped to cry out for um, issues of justice like Martin Luther King Jr., or um, people who were so compassionate with the poor like St. Francis Assisi of Assisi, and, or um, people who were, who were so devout even in the face of terrible violence um, and, and evil um, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the face of, of Hitler, right? And, so, and, and all of these people um, who helped to show me what it means to be a pastor. Um, and so I'm just grateful for that. And I think that that's a... Uh, I love... Pastor Hall, before he left, told me about the hands of ordination. Yeah. And he, he had mentioned that, and he kind of went over it. And he stuck his chest proudly whenever he spoke of it. He was, that was something that he showed pride in, and, and he was not a prideful man. Yeah. He, but he was proud to be a part of that lineage. Of that lineage yeah. And the passing of the mantle, in this instance, it is literal. In, in the yeah. story of Elisha and, yeah. and Elijah, but in in the, the sense that we're talking, it becomes more metaphorical. Interestingly, when they um, when they're appro- when people are approved for ordination at annual conference, they take um, somebody who's retiring and they take somebody who's new getting newly ordained, and they literally have a mantle, and they they have. So this year it was. Uh, the, it was it was Lynn Dyke, who's a former district superintendent, and then another another person who's just uh, becoming a pastor. And they she was wearing a mantle, and the bishop literally took it, took off, it off of her head and put it onto him, just as a symbol of that pastor. That's beautiful. And then read the read the story from Second Kings. Yeah, it's really so nice. okay, maybe it's not metaphorical. Thank you for well, <laughs> proving me wrong. Well, it's <laughs> metaphorical for most folks, just so, not those two. But but the but. It, it's okay to be metaphorical because it's the power is yeah. not in the mantle. Right. Yeah, the power is not in Moses' staff. Right. Um, it's 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 God's power. Right. And the the thing for me to remember, and the thing that I that I take away from this sermon is that that mantle is mine as well as it is yours. Right. Yes, you have different responsibilities than I do on a day-to-day basis, but but that mantle lives within me as well. Right. And um, my lineage would be a little bit harder to trace, but it's there. Yeah. There there are people, there's a mantle in each one of us to, to go out and spread God's love. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for us, I think that's the power of the Holy Spirit working with us through baptism. Right, so when when are we given the gift of the Holy Spirit? Um, we, as as people who are sacramental, we say that with, um, we say that baptism is the place where we're given that special gift. So, yeah, that's the, right. Power of the Holy Spirit within us. Well, anything else? Did I miss anything? <laughs> I mean, I missed. I missed I'm some things. I know. But we've only got 45 more minutes of this podcast. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you better be getting lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again, thank you so much for being a part of our podcast today. Thanks. Thanks for being a part of our church. And I pray um, each each day that you're here with us, that that you um, take that mantle and run with it yeah. and, and really lead our church in a great direction. And I have faith that you will. Yeah. Can I offer us a prayer? Absolutely. Right? Please, go ahead. Okay. Most gracious and holy God, we give you thanks for Memorial United Methodists. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit that is working within us. Um, to give us the power to participate with God's work in the world. We pray that during this time of transition, as the mantle has been passed, um, that you are alive in us and helping us to tell others the good news of your resurrection, that Christ has died, that Christ has risen, and that Christ will come again. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. What better way to close it? Thank you so much for being a part. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for the prayer. Um, I was terrified about this, by the way. Well, you should be. 
It was terrible, wasn't it? It was, it was horrible. No, it was fine. It's great. I enjoyed it. No, so um, last week, I have to apologize. We had a little bit of a hiccup on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. All of our um, podcasts, it went up, but it just happened to go up on a day when those websites were like down and having glitches. So if you didn't check out last week's, I encourage you to visit our Facebook page or our YouTube page, and you can check check out last week's. It was a great podcast with Reverend Ann Mowry. You don't want to miss it. It was awesome. Again, every week at 7 a.m. on Wednesday is when this podcast is loaded. So you want to catch it. And I, I there's too many ministries to, to list off that, Unite, that Memorial United Methodist Church is a part of. So please come and check us out at one of our services. We have an 8 a.m. kind of gospel service. We have a 9 a.m. that's a contemporary service. Now, the 9 a.m. service is down in the Fellowship Hall. If you get here and you don't know where that's at, just ask somebody. They're very friendly around these parts, and they'll direct you in the right direction. The 1030 service is back up here in the sanctuary. I encourage you to come to one, uh, two, or all three if you want. Uh, I encourage you to just come in and listen and grab one of our bulletins, our bulletins are a little bit larger now. I assume a change that you probably help lead there. And we've got all services in one bulletin, so you can kind of see what the flavor of Memorial United Methodist Church is. Come and check us out and be a part of our ministries and help spread the Word of God. Thank you for being a part of this this week, and hope to see you next week.